Welcome back to the Football Outside the Box podcast where we discuss the past, the present, and in fact, the future of football. Yo, on this topic right now, I remember when we had, we did have a three horse race in the title race. And I remember your comment on Liverpool being the outright favourites and you don't see them dropping any more points for the rest of the season. Now you have had a lot of correct predictions this season. However, this one mid-season in was not one of those. What do you make of this Liverpool side and their title hopes crumbling right in front of our very eyes? What do I think? I think it's... Well, I I guess before we begin, I I think this is the reason why Theo said he's busy. He He does not want to talk about his club right now. Um, and you'll notice that it, it's the it's just us two today, me and um, one man of the match. But yeah, I mean, I, what what's happened is the pressure got to them, and with, I did not expect that. I did not expect that from this Liverpool side, which is very surprising to see. Maybe uh, I mean, you you associate Liverpool and, and Jurgen Klopp with with having such strong mentality. You know, to be able to come back, for example, from three 0 down against Barcelona, um, and also going toe to toe with with City, you know, winning every single game for what fifteen matches towards the end of the season, we are simply just not seeing that right now. And maybe, maybe that it is the right time for Jurgen Klopp to leave because he does not seem like he can do anything to turn this around at this point. Yeah, well, I mean, I think on top of the fact of what you said, I think it's also a bit of burnout. I mean, like you said in the past before, we've seen this with Jurgen Klopp sides, the burnout after a certain amount of time. But then I also saw something recently that kind of struck me. This Liverpool midfield is quite different from those successful Liverpool midfields that we've seen in the past. Just stylistically, like Henderson, Wijnaldum, workhorses. Yeah. Now we've got technical McAllister, Sabosai. So I wonder if that just doesn't play into club system. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, maybe, but but they've done well until, you know, until March, right? I, I would put it more down to to just burn out, um, if anything. I remember a game against, I think it was Sparta Prague. They were up 5-1. They, they went away and they beat them. They thrashed them 5-1. And the week after, he played a very strong eleven, and then he took off Salah against against us against United at Old Trafford three days later. So, a lot of Liverpool fans thinking that's the point that kind of you know crumbled, started to crumble things down a little bit. There was no reason to play. I mean, it's just one game, right? Does it really matter that much? But yeah, the pressure getting to them as well as. The players just they're they're knackered at this point of this in the season. Yeah, they really are knackered. And even so, with, with that midfield though that we're talking about and these crumbling moments, clap out looking like slot in for Liverpool. Hey, hey be careful on the pronunciation there because we do not <laughs> Yeah, what, what what is the right pronunciation? Do you I, know? I don't, I, I I don't know. I'm not I'm not Dutch, but <laughs> I was about to call this man slot machine and see if <laughs> Liverpool were gonna hit big on the slot machine. Don't let me take my title away, bro. <laughs> okay, I mean, so so you think he's gonna be a success? Well, I'm I'm raising the question. I mean, slot machine. There's a risk. There's a big jackpot win, or there's a. Oh, yeah, yeah. Terrible investment failure. So can look at it both ways. What do you think? You think you think the slap machine can hit the jackpot? I I'm very wary to say. Um, but it looks promising. From I mean, anybody who is replacing Jurgen Club is gonna have a big hurdle to to begin with. Never let alone getting his job, you know, started. He has some good tendencies from what I've seen. 
I think some of the complaints from Liverpool fans, of course, I'm sure they love love club, but some of the complaints there, you know, they don't necessarily dominate games in a way that City do, in a way where, you know, City pin the opponent and they're able to sustain attack in a in a very recognizable pattern. Whereas Liverpool are more, you know, they rely on energy. They're very dynamic, fast transition, but they sometimes struggle to maintain that pressure on on the opponent. Um, and they have a very, you know, they rely heavily on crosses. You know, they're, they're, there's a reason why they're called cross and inshallah. And plus, you know, Salah do something for us. So on, on that front, uh, the the new guy coming in, I, I'm not, I'm not going to try to say his name because I don't want to butcher it. But that guy, it looks like he has more tendency to use the middle than than Klopp would in, in, in an ideal world. You know, like you mentioned about the previous midfield structure. Liverpool's midfield, when they were at their peak, was just about energy. Like you said, workhorses. None of them were necessarily technical in a sense where you see, like, like you said, McAllister or, or Soboslai are nowadays. So we'll see. Um but it, it's gonna it's a tough task to replace Jurgen Klopp. And it, it was yeah. surprising that they yeah, it's surprising that they paid that much money for a manager. Maybe they, they really do believe in that guy. Yeah, and I think I think Liverpool always have a they 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 already have the culture, they already have the tradition where that's concerned. It's just really not about ensuring that this new manager can implement his own kind of style and strategy onto Liverpool. And at the end of the day, it's a results business. They do have a good team, or he does have a good team that he's kind of inheriting, at least. There's a few additions you probably want to add from a Liverpool fan perspective. But overall, I think it's looking like a decent, at least a decent attempt. Yeah, on that front, on, on the style front, I will say in the in Europe's top seven leagues, I don't know why they picked top seven. Usually, it's, you know, I, I guess that includes the Dutch league, that's why. But Feyenoord, the team he's he's coaching right now, leads every single team in high turnovers, chances leading from high turnovers, and goals leading from high turnovers. I mean, that's what Jurgen Klopp wants, right? Winning the Winning the ball high up the field. And fast transition, um, that's that's very similar to Ten Hag what what he wants to do, but this is why I'm wary to say if it's gonna work in, in a higher league because Eric Ten Hag's team is <laughs> getting played off the pitch by every single team. So we'll see if that transition can work, but at least he has the the pedigree. I don't know if if, if he would say that's the right word or somewhat of a resume to prove that he he can do the job at Liverpool. I find that interesting because it seemed like back in the day, like that was, I don't want to say back in the day, but just a few seasons ago, that was such an important way of playing, such an important stat. That it's all about how how you're winning the ball high up the field, how quick is your ball retention, which is still an important fact in today's game. But we're noticing a lot of the teams playing out from the back, and they are being successful. So like Arsenal, City, even Aston Villa, like we had a stat the other day, Emi Martinez has the most time on the ball in the Premier League, which is pretty incredible. And for an over overperforming Villa side as well. So I wonder if that is kind of, the, the change in football is kind of why Ten Hag hasn't had the success that he's had in this period because he's trying to play that style that doesn't necessarily work nowadays. And I wonder if for Liverpool, the same kind of thing happens. I wonder if this is a kind of a Dutch thing, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'm struggling to think of a Dutch manager having success in, in the Premier League. I mean, Van Gaal, he, he, was, he was an interesting character, but he did not have a success here. I mean, who else is there? Goose hitting? I mean, he was just a caretaker manager. Uh, I'm, yeah. Has there has there ever been a Dutch manager in in the Premier League? I don't know, but somebody gotta let us know if there was one for sure. But what I do know is that there is a successful German on the field, and he has done it yet again. 
Man, <laughs> I'ma have the Shakira song stuck in my head, bro. <laughs> Samina Mina yet again, bro. This guy. Whoa. But let's first talk about Hulk. Cause we ain't got a chance to talk about this, but this man haunts Chelsea in obviously, in my opinion, the most beautiful way. And Tottenham. I know, and Tottenham. I, won't get to, I wanted to get to that in a second. Right. I want to save that one. Because first I want to ask. The situationally, in under normal circumstances, of course, it's seen as a disrespect to celebrate against your old club. But situationally, this time, with the fact knowing that this guy got ridiculed by his fans, by everyone, pundits all around, and he comes now again and scores against Chelsea twice and celebrates beautifully. You think that the, the celebration was almost deserved at that point, or you think he still should have kept his cool? I'm not I'm not gonna be a celebration police or celebration cop, as as you guys call them. If he wants to celebrate, so be it. Go ahead. But I, I don't know if that I don't I don't know. I mean, if Mason had Mason Mountain celebrated, I would I would maybe understand because he's He's being booed by Chelsea fans. Chelsea fans hate him for how he left the club. But Kai Havertz, I, I, as far as I know, there's not that much bad blood between them and Chelsea fans, or him and Chelsea fans. So, uh, I mean, I get it. It's in the moment, you know, in, in the title race against your 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 rivals and your your former club. Yeah, he's he's having a good spell, so I can I can see it. He's so good for him. He's he's doing the job that he's being asked to do. But I guess my question is, you guys paid, what, 70 million pounds for him? My question is, someone else could have done that job for maybe half the price of that. But who, though? Because I don't think people give a lot of credit to what Havertz has actually done for Arsenal this season. Like, I look at the share points one. Direct points one. Like this guy won us three points against Luton, six points, points against. against Brentford. Yeah. You know, and I'm just looking, that's just off the top of my head. Like there's been other game winners, other match. I see even this match here against Tottenham. He had an excellent performance. He got an, he had a goal and an assist in a in a match that was a three-two win. So I could consider that another three points added thanks to him. Where that's already like you know what I'm saying? How many points is that? That's 10 off the top of my head. So where would we be without him, you could ask? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I hear you. I just... Because I remember Havertz being signed to replace Shaka, right? I mean, you you would agree in the beginning that was, that was the plan, right? I would say that was our perception of the plan, but yeah. Yeah, but then now he's being played as... As a Jesus, I I will just say simply put Jesus replacement, and he's he's bringing in the goals. That's why I'm I'm saying, you know, maybe someone else could have done that. But but then I guess how are you gonna find a striker for for that price who can bring you like you said at least nine points, unless your name is McTominay. Of course he's he's given us twelve points this season, um, but but yeah, again, like like you said, his performance against Tottenham too. I did not expect that performance from Arsenal. You know, I, maybe I think that's what you would have hoped against City too. You know, sitting back, soaking the pressure, hitting them on a counter. I remember a very good chance against City at the towards the end where I'm thinking that should be Martinelli instead of Chossar on the ball. Yeah, as in the thing is, Arsenal get Arsenal get mis misperceived. I think at times. Like Arsenal are actually a very disciplined team. And if you make Arsenal have to sit back, Arsenal will sit back, like if needed, you know? Arsenal obviously want the ball, but Arsenal don't mind sitting back and doing that dirty, organized work. So I don't think, even though it may have come across like that, especially in the first half, I don't think Arsenal were ever in an uncomfortable position at all. I was just yeah. more, more upset at the second half, just gave away that two goals pretty much unnecessarily yeah. but with one we move from it three points the way I see that 
Yeah, I know. I know you were very nervous towards the end. Um, I guess that brings us to question. I'll give you a chance to kind of shit on on Tottenham because Tottenham can only play one way, it seems. And if you remember five months ago when they had two players sent off against Chelsea and they still played that crazy highlight and they they let Jackson and I think it was Sterling in dozens of times and about about dozens of times they were offside until they finally got through. But, you know, I remember Tottenham fans saying, oh yeah, uh, we, we still praise the team, the manager for playing the way they want to play. But now, I don't know if they're making the Champions League. And if you're not getting, I mean, you didn't get the results then against Chelsea. I think it was 4-1 in the end. Didn't get the results against Arsenal. They don't seem to have the flexibility like like you just described, like Arsenal do. I mean, what do you what do you see for Tottenham next season if they continue to play this way? Because it could go both ways, right? I remember Jurgen Klopp having the same issues when he first came into Liverpool. He was getting exposed against the so called lower sides, you know, getting exposed in in his back line because his defense was not up to par until he brought in Van Dijk. But when he brought in Van Dijk, everything was fixed. And they go on to win the Premier League and the Champions League. So I guess my question is, what what do you see for Tottenham? Because they're getting found out. And there's no plan B for Plastic Call Club. Where could they go from here next season? So for some reason, it came across me last night where I saw a post. It was at Arsenal beat Tottenham away two, twice in a row, two consecutive matches. But for some reason, it just hit my mind where I was like, where am I seeing this Tottenham team go for real? Like without Kane now, even though obviously they didn't win anything with Kane. None of them won anything without him either. But <laughs> still, <laughs> hey, they, they won the they won the Carlin Cup without Kane. Alrighty. Anyways, um, so yeah, without Kane now, I don't think that there are one signing fix as you kind of relate to Van Dijk with Liverpool. I don't say that. I don't say that for them. I see. A lot of changes that need to be made. I see them trusting the manager, which I can, you know, appreciate and respect to some degree. But trust isn't always just the answer. You don't just trust and then that's it. Like, oh, magic is going to happen. All of a sudden, he just may not be the right guy, right? Like you said, lack of flexibility. That is a factor to consider, right? If you're if you're a manager, you have to be adaptable. You have to be able to deal with certain certain situations, different situations. You need to be able to have a plan B when, when it's ready, when you need. That's something that Arteta got criticized for, Arsenal got criticized for many years, you know? So is that something that that Ange is not, is not implementing into his sides that could be an improvement for him? Probably. And I think that the attention and the spotlight is not highlighting that right now because... He's not managing a big team. And I mean that. Tottenham is not going to get the same highlight that Arsenal gets, that Man U gets, that Chelsea gets, that Liverpool gets. They're not going to get the same highlight and attention. And I think the more that Anne slips up with Tottenham, they're not, he's not going to get the same questions raised as Ten Hag is going to get raised at, at Man United. And the patch... Questions are there, for sure, as you can see with Chelsea. I just think for some reason with Chelsea, like people are willing to give that one more season to at least see if there's a turnaround for Poch. We've seen success with him before in the past in the Premier League, at least in terms of the play style and overachieving relative to your club. But overall, I don't see Tottenham on the right path. And I don't mean that as a rival fan. I genuinely don't see them on the right path. But I love it. Yeah, just wanted to give you that opportunity. I, I know you have doubts over, as you as you would always, uh, against Tottenham. But, I mean, I guess something a bit more generic. You know, we've, we've been speaking a lot of specific teams and, and matches, but you will have noticed that there's been a lot of goals, especially for, for Arsenal matches, you know, 5-0 against Chelsea, 3-2 Tottenham. 
three one against against United. Something that is in common with a lot of the teams is this season with what four more rounds to go for most teams has already seen the most number of goals scored in a single season that consists of 20 teams. And I bring up the the Arsenal United 3-1 match because you guys scored twice in stoppage time, right? Statistically, there's been 3.27 goals per match. I think the next closest is somewhere around 2.7. I mean, that's crazy. 0.5 more goals per match. You play two matches, there's one more goal. That's 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 insane. I will say most of it is down to Sheffield United. They've conceded the most goals for a single team. It's worse than the the Derby team of two thousand seven, two thousand eight. I mean, Sheff, they're I'm sorry, they're a disgrace. They should never have come up. They didn't spend. We 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 touched on this before. Um, they just they were just here for the money. And we'll we'll touch on the money later too with the spending cap. But three things being. 11 minutes of 11 minutes and 39 seconds on average of added time. The next closest is I think like eight minutes something. So that's three minutes higher than we've seen in history. So 138 goals in added time. Two of those being from, from Arsenal against United way back. The next closest, in fact, the only triple digits that we have seen in a season is back in 2016 17. And that even that was 102. So that was barely touching three digits, right? And lastly, I don't know if this is necessarily a trend that, that will continue, but we've seen an exceptionally high conversion rate for penalties. This season, we're at 90.3%. The next closest, not even close, 81.6%. So these three things, of course, there's other things, you know, there's been a lot more uh, chances created from high turnovers. There's been a lot more big chances created. And it, I don't know, is that down to teams being weaker defensively or just teams being better organized tactically? You know, we see we even see the likes of Crystal Palace bringing in a very progressive manager. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see if that this is a trend that continues. But if you thought this season was one of the most interesting seasons uh, in recent history, you will be correct. Because if you're if you like goals, you have been in for a treat this this season. Absolutely. No cap on goals this season, but there is now going to be a cap on Premier League club spending, as you mentioned. What's your take on the whole thing? I mean, do you think this is a good implementation or do you think this is too much of a change too quick? I I think I hear where, where they're going with. So simply put, the teams can only spend... I think it was five times, up to five times as much as the the lowest TV revenue for a single team in the Premier League. So an example that was brought up was Leeds last season were the lowest at 118 million pounds from TV. So do that quick math. I think it's like 700 million pounds if you times that by five or, or 600. That's the most you can spend in a season. Um, apparently Chelsea were the only ones that would have been affected by that. So real in the short term, we'll, we don't know how much it's going to affect the teams. And plus, I think they said this doesn't even come into play until at, at the earliest 2025. But to me, it doesn't make sense because it's not like the Premier League is the only league that players can go to, right? So in, in a way, in a lot of American leagues, like like the NFL has a, has a I don't I don't know in detail but NFL NBA they all have a salary cap but really those are the only leagues that for those respective sports the top tier athletes can go play you know but the Premier League isn't the only place that Mbappe can play you know I mean it's a, he's going to Real Madrid so why put a cap on yourself when I get it the other other leagues are not as lucrative as as they are already as the Premier League, but why why put a cap on yourselves? That could put yourselves the <clears throat> the whole league at at a disadvantage when the other leagues aren't necessarily bound to that rule. Right. How does that how does that affect the European coefficient? No. 
how does that right. affect the team's Champions League opportunities? So it might actually be a, a negative for the club. I mean, for the for the league as a as a whole for it. Right. I mean, the Premier League already is struggling in, in Europe. You know, there's there's no there's only Aston Villa remaining in Europe. Um, I know three different English teams have won it in the last five years, but historically it's been dominated by the Spanish teams, even even Bayern Munich or and any any C Milan and, and so on. So I'm not sure if this is necessary. I mean, if you tell me this is a UEFA wide introduction, I'll be all for it because it can bring more parity. Right? We we will see the likes of Burnley being able to compete for for the league, just like we see in, in the NFL. The NFL there's things that can be said about it in, in a negative sense, but there's so much parity in that league. Whereas in in most European leagues, there there just isn't. You know, we we're seeing only a handful of amount of teams that can realistically win anything. So unless it's a European wide introduction, I I don't really see the purpose of this. I'm I'm surprised that this was approved by 16 teams. Yeah, and another negative for me is I like to see an incentive for teams who finish higher in the table. I like to see I like to see like a reasoning for that because me me as a team, if I'm thinking, okay, like if I finish here, if I finish eighth or if I finish tenth, it doesn't change my 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 budget essentially, like my spending cap. Right. It doesn't change. So what's the incentive for me to finish? eighth in this regard you know i mean i right. get it like or eighth or ninth or tenth or ninth whatever it is the point is right. i'd like to see an incentive for finishing higher and being competitive till the end of the season right <clears throat> yeah i mean like you said there's no i mean this doesn't change your revenue you know it's not like you're equally you in the league is not giving them 500 million pounds equally to spend on on whatever. If that was the case, okay, sure. I'm I'm all for it. If the league gives you a set amount of money and you can only spend that much to everybody, that and that's your so quote unquote revenue. Okay. But like you said, what's the point of coming in seventh and missing out on, on every single European competition when someone a team that comes in the seventeenth and they barely escape relegation, and they can spend the same amount of money, and they're tied to the right. same, same regulations and, and and rules as you. So, there there should be a balance of some sorts. Um, but then I, I like I said I, I hear their point because now you see you would see, you know, teams would want to balance out the TV revenue a bit more, whereas maybe. The top teams are getting, let's say, two hundred million pounds, and the lower teams are getting hundred million. Maybe they would even that out a bit more to somewhere close to hundred fifty million each, so that it increases the cap for for everybody a bit more. Yeah, I mean that could also potentially be a solution as well. I mean, I just don't think they're tackling it the right way. I like how it is to an extent. I do get that there is a a big difference between the top teams and the smaller teams, and I get that they're trying to minimize that to some degree but you know christian did a, a video on it the other day about the status quo i don't necessarily see it like that i just see it as yo if you if you win then you should be rewarded as such you know like we were for example i mean we we're playing scrimmage the other day football and we were talking about making three teams in the scrimmage you know having three teams of five aside or whatever and the discussion is, should the winner should they play king system where if there's a draw, should the winning team stay on, like the team who was on for the longest stay on, or should the the team that stayed on the least stay on? And so the thinking behind both is, so if the winner stays on, like whoever was on the longest, then they've kind of earned that right to be able to draw. And then the other side of it is as the losing team, you know, you 
you get a chance to play. You, you create more rotation. You get you get more even rotations in because you know that if you're truly the king, you should be winning the game. Is what the thinking is. Me personally, I prefer the king system. And I don't know if I'm explaining this a bit confusing, but I prefer the king system because I like the concept of you earning the victory and earning the right to be able to have that uh, have that that boost have that bonus you know incentives i believe in incentives yeah i i, I hear you i guess for that you know you're kind of taking everything out of context right there's no pedigree that comes with one team or the other team within your in your scrimmage um i i hear you though winning you shouldn't be punished for winning and you shouldn't be rewarded for losing De definitely not i mean that's what i don't like about american leagues you get rewarded for losing and teams whether they deny it or not they actively try to lose when there's a top prospect coming into them into the fold so that brings me to this question would you ever like to see something like the draft coming into i will we'll just say the premier league but football in general no, for the same reason I was saying, I don't want to see, like, the same reason you were just saying, I don't want to see last place get first pick. I don't want to see that. Like, me as a team, I'm going to be like, if I don't see a chance of winning, I'm just like, all right, guys, just, like, lose every game now so we get the first draft pick at the end. Well, if you get relegated, you wouldn't get the first pick. It, 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 I guess that's a little different than, than the American leagues, but... Yeah. Well, I get you get my point in the sense of, yeah. okay... 17th yeah, yeah 17th guys but i mean the thing is you can't necessarily say i'm gonna lose every game and, and come 17th right in a sense so but yeah i don't know what the right solution is but i think i think we're in agreement that just a blanket cap spending cap isn't necessarily the right solution for what they're they're trying to achieve and with that point, that pretty much wraps up today's episode. I'm touching on a lot of topics. Liverpool, their new manager, Arsenal and their rivals, and the league and their direction in general. Let us know your thoughts on this episode in your comments or on our TikTok page or any of our social media page for that matter. We will... Talk to you guys next week with hopefully the full crew and the Champions League is coming up this week and the week after. So we'll see. That's all we have time for today. Guys, thanks for tuning in as always. We hope you enjoyed your time with us. Remember to subscribe, to leave comments and share with your friends. Follow us on social media at FOTBPod. Don't forget to leave a review, rating and most importantly, don't forget to turn on those notifications. Join us again next time as we discuss the highly anticipated upcoming Premier League action. Thanks again as always. See you then.